So good afternoon and welcome to our Amores Letizia Talks. I am Pedro Gabriel, and today we have Professor Rocco Buttiglione with us. So Rocco Buttiglione has been ordinary professor of philosophy of politics at University of Teramo, he uh, of philosophy of politics and of political science at the St. Pius University of Rome, and of philosophy with a particular consideration for the philosophy of politics and of society at the International Academy of Philosophy in the Principality of Liechtenstein, where he was also a prorector. He has also taught at several other universities and has received an honorary doctorate at the Catholic University in Lublin and at the Francisco Marroquin University in Ciudad de Guatemala. He has also been active in the field of politics as Minister for European Affairs and Minister of Culture for the Italian government and also as member of the European Parliament of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, where he was also Vice President and of the Italian Senate. He has also been an advisor to the Papal Commission on Justice and Peace. He has written more than a dozen books on several hundred papers on different topics, namely on John Paul II's thought, which will be the main focus of this interview. So Butiglione is currently professor at the Instituto de Filosofia Edith Stein in Granada, Spain, and is also currently a member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences and of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas. He is married to Maria Pia and has four daughters and 12 grandchildren. So Rocco, welcome to our program. It's an honor to have you here. It is an honor to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for accepting this interview. So, uh, first of all, as I said, the, our interview will focus uh, mostly on uh, Pope St. John Paul II's thought and life. So, could you briefly describe to me your opinion on John Paul II, its main highlights, and the general impact that this pontificate had for the Church and the world? Well, it is not easy, at least not in a short time. Uh, I would say, First of all, uh, he, he was um, he was a saint. Uh, everybody who was near to him could testify uh, of this. Uh, he uh, had a, a beaming humanity, and it was impossible uh, to be near to him and not to be taken by this humanity. Um, I have been a friend. I have worked with him. I have uh, eaten with him. I have. Uh, uh, I have sang with him. He was a good singer. Uh, <laughs> and, but when he comes back in my dreams, what comes back is always the first time I saw him. I was a boy in a crowd. He passed by. He watched me in my eyes. He shook my hand. And I had the distinct impression, there is a man who would give his life for you if need be. And when there is such a man, <clears throat> and this man is not your father, not your mother, uh, not even your sister or brother, uh, then at least uh, the doubt that this love must have a supernatural root must come to you. And this uh, doubt accompanies you throughout all your life. I tell this because this is the impression that many people who met him have had. And all those who later became closer friends and more occasions to, to be with him, and those who saw him only once, uh, they all had the same impression. He was a man of God. All right. So um, obviously his pontificate also had a big positive impact on the church and even on the world. Uh, what would you say would be the main points in which John Paul II made this positive impact on the church and the world? Well, look, um, we were used to think that um, um, the world had been divided in two by the Yauta agreements. <clears throat> and the, the Yauta agreements, the agreements that uh, divided Europe uh, in a Soviet part and uh, in a democratic part, we were used to think that these agreements could be called in question only through a war, through a nuclear war. And this means they could not be uh, questioned. And uh, these agreements were questioned um, through uh, a movement that was a cultural and, uh, and a religious movement. And the leader of this movement was John Paul II. 
um, we found, not with weapons, but with the weapons of charity, of culture, of dialogue. Uh, we made an appeal to the conscience of our opponents. We did not want to call them enemies, even in difficult times, even when uh, in uh, in Poland um, the the communists uh, killed our people. I think of Father Jerzy Popiewusko. Uh, I think that uh, his cause of beatification is now ongoing. Um, the uh, John Paul II always said. Uh, we must respect every man. We must make an appeal to conscience. Weapons do not shoot by themselves. They need men. And if men are not convinced that they are facing an aggression, if men are called to make use of their moral sense, then these men will become our brothers. And so we had the miracle. Uh, the communist regime fell down without blood. Perhaps it would have fallen also uh, without John Paul II. But it would have fallen in a civil war from uh, the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic Sea, a civil war that might have easily triggered the Third uh, World War, a nuclear war. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think this is a miracle, the real first great miracle of uh, the pontificate of John Paul II. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, is a kind of, this is the end of an historical epoch. Some people oppose uh, John Paul II to Pope Francis, um, and they do not understand that John Paul II stands at the end of an historical epoch, and then a new historical epoch begins. And we cannot uh, continue an historical epoch that is over. And, uh, and that uh, explains many of the differences of the two pontificates within the same fundamental inspiration. Um, popes are like, um, orchestra directors. They can put different accents, but the music is the same. Take, uh, um, I don't know, uh, Manfred Honeck, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, uh, Barenboim. They are two great uh, orchestra directors and they put different accents. But when they play uh, the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, the symphony does not belong neither to Honeck nor to Barenboim. It belongs to Beethoven. And so the music of the life of the church belongs to God. Yes, and that's precisely uh, a very good insight because that's one of the points of this interview is that many of the critics of Pope Francis tried to pit Francis against John Paul II as if they were in opposition. Uh, and mostly they also, mo much of this opposition uh, comes from Amoris Laetitia. They say that Amoris Laetitia contradicts John Paul II's pontificate. And this happened because John Paul II promulgated an apostolic exhortation named Familiaris Consortio, where he did not allow communion for divorced and remarried people uh, unless they would agree to not live more uxorio, uh, that is, without sexual intercourse, as brother and sister. So uh, what changed with Amoris Laetitia relatively to the previous sacramental discipline? Uh, and how can we reconcile Amoris Laetitia and Familiaris Consortio? Well, look, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, there is a difference, of course. There is a difference in the discipline, the sacramental discipline. It is not a difference in the fundamental moral theology. Um, uh, what is the point? Take Familiaris Consortio. Uh, before Familiaris Consortio, um, the uh, divorcees were practically excommunicated. They were not invited to attend the Mass. They were not welcome if they set foot in uh, the parish church. And the Familiaris Consortio makes a revolution. Familiaris Consortio says, no, we want you to come. You are welcome. Come to the Mass. Um, we give a religious education to your children. Uh, we cannot allow you to receive communion, but uh, we want you to be members of the church. This was a revolution, a change. They were no more excommunicated. Um, there was a last pass, but the possibility of receiving the sacraments. Uh, John Paul II did not do that because he lived in a society in which he could expect people to um, uh, 
to be scandalized by uh, the commune given to divorcees. Um, now, unfortunately, we live in a society in which this would not be any more a scandal because this situation of divorced people has become commonplace. There are so many of them. And we run the risk that if they do not give a religious education to their children, then their children will remain out of the church. Um, this does not mean that uh, to have sexual intercourse out of marriage uh, in a, 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 a civil marriage that is not recognized by the church is no more a sin. It be means that before it was a special sin, you could not go to the confessor and confess the sin. You could not with the confessor evaluate the attenuating circumstances that might to a certain extent justify what you, you were doing. Um, you were excluded uh, also from confession. Uh, now you can go to the confession. You can talk, you can explain, and uh, you can uh, initiate with uh, your confessor a, a path leading you back to the full participation to the life of grace. And along this path, at a certain point, uh, you may receive uh, an encouragement to receive the communion. Uh, why, under which circumstances, uh, the Pope does not want to make uh, 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 a, an examination of the different cases, because the cases are infinite in number. If you want later, I can give, tell you some cases in which I think this could happen. But he says only uh, talk to your confessor, and the confessor must take the responsibility of uh, uh, giving you uh, adequate counsel, of, of leading you back. Of course, the point of arrival is that if you are in a marriage that is not a real marriage, you must interrupt the sexual intercourse with your partner. But when, how, uh, on this we can discuss. Uh, so um, you have actually written a book, a book in defense of Amoris Laetitia, which I have right here. It's titled Risposti Amichevoli ai Critici di Amoris Laetitia, which is Italian uh, for uh, a friendly response to the critics of Amoris Laetitia. Uh, this was for a long time the only one of two books that I know of that was defending the document. So uh, what drove you to write this book? Well, um, uh, I was in uh, Vienna uh, giving classes in a local university and my friend Guzman Karikiri called me by phone and told me, Rocco, they are attacking the Pope. Uh, you must do something to defend him. And I thought for a while, what would John Paul II uh, tell me if he were here? And I had no doubt he would tell me, uh, defend the Pope. Not because he's Bergoglio, not because he's Boitiwa, because the Pope is the Pope, first. And second, because he's right. And then I, uh, I started uh, writing the articles that were collected in this book. Um, they tried, some people tried, to make of John Paul II an enemy of the Vatican Council, a reactionary, a conservative. No, he was 100% a man of the Council. Uh, of course, he uh, was against some wrong interpretation of the Council that uh, uh, understood the Council as a break in the history of uh, the Church. No, uh, in the history of the Church there is always continuity and innovation. Uh, neither innovation without continuity nor continuity without innovation. On the same fundamental uh, uh, ground, New buildings can be added, but remaining faithful to the inspiration of Jesus Christ, who is the only founder uh, of the church and the only stone on which the church rests. And Peter is uh, the, uh, uh, let us say, the vicar of Christ in, uh, in the history of the world. So that's the reason why I wrote. By the way, um, John Paul II was also a philosopher. Uh, Mm -hmm. and a very innovative philosopher. He wrote a book um, on uh, uh, the acting person that it was a kind of philosophy of the council. And 
the philosophy of the council consists in the fact that the same truth is presented uh, beginning with the everyday experience of uh, the men of today. Uh, there is only one truth. John Paul II was absolutely against any kind of relativism. But there are many paths leading to this truth. Uh, the path that leads to this, this truth in the 13th century is different from the path leading to this truth in the 21st century. The path leading to this truth, uh, beginning in Poland with a uh, national Polish culture, is different from the path leading to the same truth and having as a starting point Argentina or Italy or whatever, or Portugal, I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, precisely. Uh, that's very interesting that you brought up the concept of person in action, the acting person. Uh, I will pick that up a little later in this interview. But for now, you also brought up an important point, which is uh, uh, Carlo Votiwa, the future Pope John Paul II, was uh, a philosopher. And he has uh, written many articles with uh, very, where he developed a very uh, interesting anthropology. So you have written about this anthropology that Carlo Voltiwa uh, developed even before he became Pope John Paul II. So my understanding is that there are some aspects of his anthropology that are not very well known. And this may be the source of misunderstandings since Francis seems to inspire himself in those forgotten anthropological principles that people uh, in uh, Catholics in general are not very well acquainted with. So therefore, people might have some trouble understanding the continuity that exists between Francis and John Paul II. So let us talk about this anthropology. Uh, let's start by talking about the tension between objective sin and the sinner's subjectivity. This was a part of Karl Votiwa's thought even before he ascended to the papacy. So in your book, you write, and I quote, the objective side of the action decides on the goodness or gravity of the action, whereas the subjective side of the action decides on the level of responsibility of the agent, end quote. So we are well acquainted with John Paul II's teachings on objectively evil acts, intrinsically evil acts that he developed in Veritatis Splendor. But what can you tell us about John Paul II's teachings on subjective responsibility and mitigating factors, which seem to be at the center of Amor's Letizia? First of all, <clears throat> this is not a particular uh, uh, doctrine of John Paul II. He holds this doctrine, but you can find this doctrine in St. Thomas Aquinas. And you find this doctrine also in the Catechism. And not only in the, the new Catechism um, of the Catholic Church, also in the old Catechism of uh, uh, St. Uh, Pius X. Uh, it is expressed in a different language. Um, to, in order to have a sin, you need an objective side, uh, gravity of matter, and you need a subjective side. The subjective side is. Um, freedom of judgment and uh, uh, knowledge of fact. Knowledge of fact means uh, you must know that what you do is wrong. If you don't know that, if you think honestly in your conscience that it is right, then there is no sin. Second, uh, you must be free. And there are situations in which you are not free. Unfortunately, in our time, with uh, so many damaged lives, people who grow without having the model of a living family, of a real family, because their parents divorced, because perhaps they never had uh, a father, because uh, many people do not have these uh, models. And um, they grow with uh, an emotional structure that is damaged and makes it very difficult for them to be really free. Now, in order to evaluate the subjective responsibility, you must consider these two elements. Um, and, uh, and then it may happen that uh, something that is objectively absolutely wrong can be uh, only a venial sin, or perhaps no sin at all, according to the situations. Uh, John Paul II added to this traditional teaching one point 
Um, the, this point uh, is that uh, um, what we might call uh, the idea of social sin or social structure sin. What is a social sin? The sin is always personal. Only persons can commit sin. But there are social structures that incline people uh, to commit sin. And when one lives within the social structures, he, it is possible that he is not completely responsible for the sin he commits. Why? Because he receives the teaching that that action is good from persons who are entitled to teach to him, for instance, from his parents and from the old culture in which he lives in. And you must evaluate this uh, when you try to build a path that leads from a specific culture toward, towards the truth on man. And this is yeah, one I... fundamental point in Amoris Laetitia. This is a, a, a chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia expands on this principle. It considers attenuating circumstances that may uh, transform a, a mortal sin into a, a venial sin. That is, uh, make it possible that you commit something that is objectively absolutely wrong, but nevertheless, you are not completely responsible for it. A great friend of John Paul II and of mine, uh, Pater Tadeusz Stichen, Stichen was the successor of Wojtyła at the Chair of Ethics of the University of Lublin, of the Catholic University of Lublin. And, um, uh, and the, perhaps the closest friend of uh, John Paul II, um, he was also a friend of mine, uh, uh, used it to say, innocence, said the no chance. You are innocent, you are not responsible, but what you do, nevertheless, is wrong. I have to explain to you that this is wrong, but I must take time and patience also because in the world of today, um, the confessor, the priest, is not an absolute authority. Once he could say, this is the doctrine of the church, and uh, you must do this. Very seldom this authority today is recognized. In his relation to the penitent, he has to show why it is true uh, what the church teaches. And in order to lead the penitent to understand that he's, that he's doing something wrong and to find the moral energy to break with the behavior, he may need time and he must have um, the capacity of uh, finding a path. And that's not always easy. And it cannot be determined abstractly, a priori. Only within the situation, you can find the path that brings you beyond the limits of the situation, that breaks uh, the limits of the mentality of the culture and leads you towards the complete truth. Yes, uh, that's a very interesting insight uh, about the structures of sin. Um, first, before I move on to that point, I would just like to point out that the teaching of mitigating circumstances is also codified in the catechism that John Paul II promulgated, uh, namely paragraphs 1860 and 1734 and 5 and 2352. And these catechism paragraphs... Excuse me, Pedro. For those who do not accept the council, I would add, it is contained in the catechism of Pius X. Yes, precisely. But, uh, correct. I'm just, I'm just pointing out for those... It has always been a doctrine of the church. It is no novelty. Yes, correct. I'm just pointing out that John Paul II is also, also taught these principles even uh, when people try to pit him against Francis. Uh, the, these catechism quotes are specifically quoted by Amoris Laetitia 302, where the sacramental discipline has been um, has been promulgated. And there's also the distinction between mortal and venial sins that Pope, Franz, Pope John Paul II brings up in Veritatis Splendor 70 and Reconciliatio Penitentia 17. So uh, Francis is not saying anything that John Paul II did not uh, did not say before. Um, now, uh, regarding the structures of sin, it's very interesting because this is another anthropological principle that John Paul II uh, brought to, to his pontificate and that not many people talk about, even though many popes after John Paul II have indeed um, talked about structures of sin. So 
John Paul II talks about structures of sin in Reconciliatio Penitentia and in Solicitudo Rei Socialis. So structures of sin predispose, as you said, people born in those structures of sin uh, to sin and therefore hinder their ability to recognize the truth and to choose it accordingly. So how would you say that the divorced and remarried couples that the Mors Laetitia is trying to bring into the church, how would you say that these divorced and remarried couples are affected by our modern structures of sin and how does this mitigate their culpability? Well, um, Carol Wojtyła in his book on uh, um, person and act, the acting person, uh, uh, he explains that uh, uh, we have the capacity to know truth, but we have also the necessity to interiorize truth. Now, uh, both these aspects in our society are problematic. Um, think of a person who, has, uh, who was born in a broken family. Uh, it was difficult for him to interiorize uh, the value of the unity of marriage. It was maybe difficult in a hypersexualized society like ours. It is very difficult to interiorize also the value of chastity. And uh, uh, if you sleep around, it is difficult later that you interiorize the value of conjugal fidelity. Uh, and many people get married and they have not a real idea of what is marriage. They don't know sometimes, but in a much larger uh, number of cases, they have not interiorized the, the value, even if they theoretically know it. And then, and then they divorce, they enter into a second marriage, and then at a certain point in their life, they want to go back to the faith, to a living faith. And they go back to a living faith, uh, having uh, uh, two marriages, having uh, procreated uh, children with a second uh, husband or, or, or wife, and they may be willing to say to the husband or, or wife, um, we cannot have uh, intercourse. It is wrong. Nevertheless, we can love each other. And they have a feelings of gratitude. This husband or, or wife may be the man who has saved them in the depression after the failure of their first marriage, he is the father of their children, uh, and they are in love to him. And, and what if he says, no, if you refuse intercourse with me, I consider this as a betrayal of our love. And he uh, leaves and, 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 uh, and creates another family. What should a, a mother or a father do under these circumstances? If he continues to have intercourse, what he does is wrong. Shall we say that it is uh, uh, so wrong uh, as to be a mortal sin? I don't know. In each particular situation, uh, you, must, uh, you must make a judgment. The, the divorcee becomes a sinner like all others. He has the right of asking for a judgment and of uh, offering the mitigating circumstances that may be present in this situation. Um, uh, by the way, I wish to add two points. The first one is uh, this idea of the structures of sin is of John Paul II, but it is not an invention of John Paul II. You can find it uh, in St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, Summa Theologica, Prima Secunda, a question, I think, uh, 90. Five, articles five and six. Uh, he explains that we, certain people do not recognize um, all the aspects of the natural uh, moral law. For instance, he makes the, the example of the Germans. He says the Germans uh, do not consider theft to be a sin. Um, and the uh, concept of structure of sin grows out of a reflection on St. Thomas Aquinas. Correct. And also the other concept that you mentioned, the concept of person in action, person in acti acting person, that's also an important part of uh, Carol Votiwa's thought. 
And uh, I, another defender of Pope Francis has been Professor Rodrigo Guerra Lopez, a member of the theological team of Salam, who also wrote about that. And uh, I have a quote from him that says that Wotiwa's personalism sees human action as a norm for a yet unfinished person, as a moral norm for a person in transit, a person in action demanding great patience and tenderness, great care and respect for the most intimate dynamics of the person, a conscience that is not educated at once, but is always on a journey. And this seems, uh, this end quote, and this seems to relate to a masterful insight that I've read in your book that perfectly incorporates Francis's principle of time being greater than space. So you write, and I quote, if no one can escape one's cross, it is also true that no story begins with the cross. It is a path. And in this journey, time is greater than space. So in what direction is the sinner moving? Towards the house of the father or away from it? So the direction of the movement marked by time counts more than the absolute distance, which is space, end quote. So this principle of per the acting person, person in act, is also present in Karol Votiwa's philosophy. So could you elaborate a bit more of what uh, John Paul II meant by person in action? Well, um, look, um, now it comes to my mind another thing. Um, we have been talking about uh, John Paul II, about Pope Francis. I want to um, outline the fact that this principle is absolutely traditional. Um, uh, I don't know whether the name of uh, Alfonso Lopez Trujillo means something to you. He was a cardinal, he was the president of the Papal Commission for the Family, and he was a very conservative cardinal. He was a traditionalist. One of the problems that we have today is that we have too many traditionalists who do not know the tradition. Uh, uh, Alfonso Lopez was a traditionalist who knew perfectly well the tradition, and he has written a small document for confessors uh, in which all the principles of Amoris Laetitia are already contained. He says, if there is somebody who has a starting point that is very far from the doctrine of the church, somebody who is committing sin or acts that are grave matter of sin, but nevertheless is not aware of this. The confessor shall not tell him that he's committing sin immediately. He shall tell, it, tell him that he's committing sin only step by step when he has acquired elements enough to understand that what he's doing is wrong. So not right away, but in a dialogue when we have arrived at the point in which he can understand that, he, that he, what he's doing is wrong. And not only, when he has acquired the moral inner strength to uh, change his behavior. So there is not a novelty of John Paul II. Of course, it is a novelty. John Paul II rediscovered it and expressed it uh, with great uh, uh, philosophical um, uh, capacity. But it is traditional doctrine of the church. You find it in a very conservative cardinal like Alfonso Lopez. You find it in Santo Alfonso de Liguori. You find it in all the history of moral theology. And some very conservative uh, theologians, uh, also today, very conservative theologians who know the, the, the tradition, the traditionalists who know the tradition, uh, recognize this. Unfortunately, there are many traditionalists who do not know the tradition of the church. They think that the tradition of the church is what the, the church used to do when they were children. And this is, of course, a part of the tradition of the church, but what is a small section? The tradition is much broader. And within this tradition, you find all the principles that Pope Francis 
uh, makes use of in Amoris Laetitia. Yes, and that's a good point because uh, that's precisely it. Both Pope Francis and Pope John Paul II are traditional, but they bring from tradition principles uh, that and develop them uh, that were forgotten by current day traditionalists. And then they confuse these elements that they bring from tradition and that have been forgotten or not or were not very highlighted before. They confuse this with novelties. No, they are traditional. They bring from the treasure of the tradition of the church something that is traditional, but then they develop it. Uh, and of course, every pope has his predilection. So and this uh, 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 his favorite ideas. So John Paul II would focus on the structures of sin, of person in act, which is very attuned to his philosophy. And uh, Francis brings more, uh, is more uh, likes more about talking about mercy and about mitigating circumstances. Benedict the Sixteenth liked to talk about truth, continuity. So. All of these are um, traditional principles, but each pope will focus on the things that are more dear to his heart. Uh, so, yes, of course, all of these principles that we have discussing of Pope John Paul II's anthropology are indeed traditional, of course, not novelties, but something that he develops. Pedro, also, we must consider that each pope has to deal with different problems. Uh, different mm -hmm. opponents. The main opponent of the church in the age of John Paul II was communism. The main opponent of the church in uh, uh, the age of the new age uh, in which we have Pope Francis is unbridled capitalism. And you can find that John Paul II began the change immediately after uh, 18, 1989, after the fall of communism, he starts a repositioning of the church in front of the problems of the new historical epoch. And uh, Pope Francis continues this repositioning of the church in front of new opponents and of new problems. Uh, and of course, there is also the other aspect that you have uh, uh, put forth, uh, that is, uh, each man has his own culture, his own uh, idiosyncrasies, and there is no greater difference than that between a Polish man and an Argentinian. Two uh, completely different uh, popular cultures, two completely different um, tem national temperaments in the unity of the same church. Correct. So now, um, in your book, you, uh, you say that mitigating circumstances are what distinguishes the realist ethics of John Paul II from the objectivist ethics of some of Francis' adversaries. So what would you say are differences between these two ethics, the realist ethics of John Paul II and the objectivist ethics of, his, uh, of Francis' opponents? And where do these critics misinterpret the thought of Carlo Voltiwa? Well, um... For uh, John Paul II, it was clear uh, there is an objective truth on moral acts. We have the right to pass a judgment on acts and say this is wrong and this is correct, this is true, this is good and this is bad. Don't be afraid to pass judgment. Now, uh, there is a, a general mentality that wants you to be not judgmental. But man is a, a, a being that needs to pass judgment. And some things are right, some things are wrong. Never pass a judgment on persons. Don't be afraid to pass judgments on state of affairs. Never pass judgments on persons. Why? Because only God knows uh, the conscience of the person. In order to be good, you must obey to your conscience. The proximate judge of your acts is your own conscience. And only God knows uh, the real state of your conscience. To a certain extent, you know that too, only to a certain extent, because very often we are wrong on our own conscience. And to an even lesser extent, uh, the, your confessor or your best friend 
may be uh, conscious of this. So if you are not a confessor uh, and, and, you, and you are passing judgments on somebody else, somebody who is not yourself, don't do that. Um, this was very clear to send uh, John Paul II. Always judge facts, never judge persons. And I think that this is exactly the point of, of conjunction with Pope Francis, who, by the way, is a Jesuit, and the Jesuits have a great tradition exactly on the issue of the direction of conscience. To direct conscience means to enter into a dialogue with the person. And this dialogue is not a, a, a communication in which you give orders and the penitent obeys. You have to talk to him and to discover together with him the path that God wants to lead him towards truth. And, uh, uh, and this corresponds exactly, even on the issue of um, mercy. Don't forget, John Paul II uh, had a great devotion to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to the idea of mercy. He has written uh, the encyclical Dives in Misericordia, and the, the devotion to uh, the merciful heart of Jesus, the devotion to Faustina Kowalska, uh, was very near to his heart. When he was a young man and he went to uh, the, um, uh, the Solvay factory, where he worked uh, in the time of the Nazi occupation of uh, Poland, he passed by the convent of uh, Faustina Kowalska, of Sister Faustina Kowalska. And he always uh, stopped there to pray, to pray uh, the merciful heart of Jesus. Correct. And uh, I would like then to pick up on the conscience. Um, so one word, it's one word that Francis critics fear a lot is conscience. And of course, this is because many liberal dissenters abuse this word. But you also connect Francis' teachings on conscience with John Paul II's thought on that matter. Uh, the difference between the liberals and Francis is that Francis acknowledges that there is an objective moral reality and conscience cannot change what is evil into what is into good. But this does not mean that there is no such a thing as subjectivity. Uh, and you try to prove it from John Paul II himself. So you write that conscience has the task of subjectivizing the truth that intellect has known. It is not enough to know what is good to do it. You must recognize it as good and identify it as good. Now, I must make it clear that subjectivizing here does not mean saying that truth is subjective, no, but that the truth must be internalized by the subject to build his interior world from whence he can make moral judgments. So can you elaborate a bit more on John Paul II's teachings on conscience and how they relate to Pope Francis's uh, pontificate? Yes, um, John Paul II says, there is an objective truth, or rather, Karol Wojtyla, because this belongs to his philosophical thought. There is an objective truth. I can know this objective truth. On the other hand, this objective truth must, must become the form of my personality. In order to become the form of my personality, the subjective truth needs to be interiorized. It cannot be opposed to uh, the interiority of my person. It must become the form of the interiority of my person. And this is only possible through a dialogue, a dialogue in which uh, it enters to constitute my personality. What is the difference with some theologians who pretended to give a, an interpretation of the council and gave a wrong interpretation of the council? They say conscience constitutes truth, um, which is true, but conscience constitutes truth, the good of the action, uh, on the basis of the objective truth of the action. Conscience is a kind of mirror. Conscience has to mirror the objective truth. And sometimes the mirror does not work well. And it may happen that uh, what is mirrored in my conscience does not correspond to objective truth. And then I am not uh, a sinner because 
I have to obey to my conscience, even to my wrong conscience. Of course, if I am acting on the basis of a wrong conscience, my friends, the church, um, have to uh, try to explain to me uh, why I am wrong. Uh, but nevertheless, the proximate judge of the action is the conscience of the person. And you cannot substitute the conscience of the person. And it is exactly what Pope Francis means when he says uh, that uh, the confessor has the task of helping the conscience to recognize truth, but there's not the task of uh, uh, um, forcing uh, the person to do something he does not recognize as truth, as his personal truth. The objective truth is the truth of my life. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem of moral life. Uh, to transform the objective truth into the truth of my life. And it, of course, takes time. There is history. The many opponents of Pope Francis, who really are opponents also of St. John Paul II, uh, they do not want to recognize the meaning of history. Uh, and this, here we come to the principle that you have quoted before. Um, it is not... You know, important all, only uh, the position that one has towards truth. It is also important the dynamic movement it is moving away from truth or towards truth. Um, uh, you remember in the gospel, Jesus sees the people who offer their money for the temple. And some Pharisees give a lot of money. And the poor widow gives only two cents. And Jesus says, those two cents have more worth uh, uh, than all the hundreds of uh, uh, gold coins given by the Pharisees. Why? Because she is poor. She gives out of her uh, misery. So the small steps towards truth made by a man who uh, was born in a broken family, who made a wrong marriage, who uh, was abused in his youth, the small steps he makes towards truth, perhaps are more valuable in the eyes of God than a, a much more perfect accomplishment of the moral good made by somebody who had a good father, a good mother, good, <laughs> good grand, uh, grandparents, uh, was raised in had a good school, was raised in a good uh, parish church, and most important of all, got to married to a good woman. Uh, to him, everything is much easier. And, but God sees also that that poor man who is a drug addict, who has had uh, so many disgraces in his life, well, he is doing much less objectively, but subjectively, it is a much greater value because, uh, because he is moving uh, towards, uh, towards truth, starting with a very biased starting point. Yes, I know that Pope Francis also made that point in uh, Amoris Laetitia about small steps from a person who has a background, who has uh, lots of baggage, uh, has uh, this, these small steps have more value than someone who is not sacrificing much because it's easier for this, this person to follow the, the path of, uh, of the church. Now, uh, I would just like to uh, make a, a final question uh, because in Veritati Splendor, John Paul II rejects certain erroneous moral theology currents of the time, like fundamental option theory and situation ethics. But some of Francis's critics have tried to say that Amoris Letizia falls into these errors. Uh, you categorically deny that that's the case. So what exactly is the difference between fundamental option theory and situation ethics and what Amoris Laetitia is proposing? Well, situation ethics says that the moral good of the action is dependent on the situation. Uh, in a certain situation, one thing can be good. In another situation, it can be bad, which is true for many actions, but not for all. There are some actions that are always uh, uh, bad and cannot become good under any circumstances. Uh, the killing of the life. 
it, intrinsically evil act. That's what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, those intrinsically uh, evil, intrinsice malum. There are some acts that are intrinsically evil. They cannot become good under any circumstances. For example, uh, the killing of an innocent human being, and perhaps also of a non-innocent human being. Um, take uh, uh, the death penalty. No? Uh, the killing of a human being is always wrong. Um, what John Paul II says is, there is the intrinsic malum, uh, but circumstances do not decide on the moral good or evil of the action, but circumstances enter into the evaluation of the subjective consciousness, and therefore also of the conscience of the person who commits the act. Uh, subjective circumstances, the circumstances can exercise such a pressure on the person that is not anymore responsible for what it does. Let us give one example. Um, the killing of a human being is always wrong, no doubt. Let us imagine that uh, uh, I am driving my car and somebody who is a, uh, a drug addict uh, is drunk uh, and he throws himself under uh, the wheels of my car and I kill him. Am I responsible? No, not at all. Let us imagine that I am a drug addict. I drive my car and I run over one person who was passing by. Am I responsible? Uh, well, only in so much as you uh, uh, took the drugs and drank more than, and then drove. I have a certain amount of responsibility. Let us imagine that I am driving my car. I see a, 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 a man who is passing by. He is my enemy. And I consciously uh, run him down because I hate him and I kill him. Am I responsible? In the first yes. case, I am not responsible. In the second case, I am, let us say, 50% responsible. And in the third case, I am 100% responsible. There is a graduation of responsibility also. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this is the point that both St. John, John Paul II and Pope Francis make. In each case, the objectivity, the act is equally wrong. Subjectivity, the responsibility may be 100%, 50%, or close to 0%. And who can judge? Only he, one who is in the situation. You must judge your own responsibility. Who can help you to judge, to understand? A person who is so close to you that he can see the situation from within, but not so directly connected so that he maintains the capacity of objectifying and seeing objectively what you have done. And that is the role of the confessor. So, okay, this is all the time then that we have for today. I would like to thank Rocco once again for accepting my invitation to talk about Amoris Letizia. To our viewers, please subscribe to be notified about new Amoris Letizia talks in the future. And also, I remind the viewers that a transcript of this video will be made available on my website, The City and the World. I will leave a description in the, uh, I will leave a link in the description below. And also links to Professor Bottiglione's book, uh, Risposti Amichevoli, in Amazon. If you know Italian or Spanish, I advise you to buy it. I would also like to remind the viewer that my book, The Orthodoxy of Amoris Letizia from Whip and Stock, is also available in Amazon, where I quote Professor Buttiglione extensively and even have a section dedicated to Buttiglione thought on objective evil and subjective responsibility, which was greatly inspired also by uh, Professor Buttiglione's uh, writings. So the link to buy will also be posted on here down below. Once again, Rocco, thank you so much for this time. And to our viewers, I wish you all a good day and uh, see you soon.